it's the sense of you're going to hit challenges and, and how do you calmly work through them? How do you navigate through um, hitting a wall, hitting a barrier, um, you know, hitting self-doubts about yourself and remaining calm and, and working through them and pushing through those boundaries. But, but secondarily, um, that sense of community that in challenging situations, whether they're athletic pursuits like ultras or, or, or career pursuits, that it's not an individual exercise, that it is a team uh, event, that it is a community event, and that, um, you know, relying on people or, or connecting with people to solve problems together is always better than uh, doing it individually. And I think that maybe resonates with me the most, which is, you know, I wouldn't have gotten through it without somebody else there on, yep. on the race day in Switzerland. Um, the same is true for business and, and throughout my career that I certainly wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had without incredible people around me. Is there anything more fascinating than human potential? In the Adelaide podcast, you'll learn how to harness your mental greatness and achieve extraordinary performance. Holy shit, like somebody's actually shooting at me. I am coming to you from an igloo. That was what One Life Is It is about for me. It's just about going out there and living your life in the best way that you know how. So your Ironman race, was that your first ever triathlon? Yes. That is, I will say, insane. And I, I just think if your knickers are right, your day goes right. Welcome to the Adelaide Podcast, teaching you how to achieve extraordinary performance. This episode is brought to you by my very own newsletter. Each week, I cover one mindset tactic to help you enhance your mental fitness. It's free and you can sign up at adelaidegoodeve.com forward slash subscribe. If I'm doing any meetups, events, special coaching programs, giveaways, or anything else that's limited, then I share it with my subscribers first. So check it out at adelaidegoodeve.com forward slash subscribe. In your welcome email, you'll receive an exclusive interview with elite endurance athlete and scientist Olaf Dulner. This beautiful ebook is perfect for an inspirational read while commuting or chilling out on a Sunday. You'll learn the mindset techniques that Olaf uses to become the best he can be, which according to his friends is superhuman. It's really easy to sign up to my newsletter. You'll get the awesome interview with Olaf. So check it out at adelaidegoodeve.com forward slash subscribe. Thanks for listening. And now on to the great conversation. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season three of the Adelaide podcast. I am Adelaide. This is my podcast, and it is great to be with you here today. Season three has been a long time coming, and I am so excited to finally share with you the amazing conversations I've been having. Now, if you've tuned in before, you may have noticed something a little different. There has indeed been a change in the name, artwork and introduction. I would love to know what you think. So do send me a DM on Instagram at Adelaide Goodeve with your thoughts. And if this is your first time listening, welcome. I would also love to know what you think too. So do slide into my DMs on Instagram at Adelaide Goodeve. Today on the podcast, we have Jamie Parker, who is passionate for adventure and sport. He's a trail runner father and CEO of Jaybird, an innovative company that creates Bluetooth sport headphones built for athletes pushing their sport to a different level. Their athletes include the amazing Rory Bozio, the incredible Knox Robinson, and one of my favourite podcasters and human beings, Rich Roll. 
You are going to thoroughly enjoy our conversation today on overcoming limits, the adventure and sport mindset, and Jamie's best leadership techniques. Now, you may hear a low level of music and noise in the background as we recorded this episode or this conversation in the lobby of a hotel in Windsor when Jamie was over from the US for business. But this does not distract or take away from our great conversation. So without further ado, here is Jamie Parker. So I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Parker. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much. Super excited to be talking to you. Yeah, me too. I can't believe we're actually doing it face to face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Considering you're based in America. Yep. Yeah, great to be here in London. And uh, as I said, you know, I was going to be here for two days. And so I thought it was a great time to connect. Yeah, no, it is. And it, Windsor is so perfectly close to me anyway. So that was very convenient. Thank you for considering that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So could you please tell our listeners who you are and what it is you do in the world today? So as you mentioned, my name is Jamie Parker, um, currently the CEO of Jaybird. And, um, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways what I'm doing in the world today is um, trying to blend a little bit of my career and my passions, which is passion for sport, passion for adventure. And, uh, and sort of blending those things so that I can kind of live the lifestyle that I want to live. Amazing. And what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? Yeah, you know, it's funny, before the show, obviously, talking about some of the things that we're both up to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, and really got caught up in sort of the, the world of adventure and sort of that mindset and um, sort of approach my daily life that way. And I look at career um, through that lens, but also sort of my sport endeavors um, through that lens and kind of came up through more of the traditional uh, team sport lens, um, playing football, uh, the UK version, the, the global version, not the American version. Oh, I seemed it was American. Yeah, no, oh. uh, soccer. Um, and, uh, you know, always looked at um, running and some of those things as just an approach to, to fitness um, for, for my sport. and. Um, really got into ultra running and sort of tapped into this this different appreciation for for sports, which was more about um, just the mindset of getting out there, exploring in a different way, not necessarily having a finish line or a destination, mm -hmm. but really just being on my feet for for a full day. And so, um, you know, it was, it was um, really exciting to kind of land at Jaybird because I felt like I could marry some of the things that I'm passionate about outside of work with uh, with some of the things that that I do in the office. So if we dive into ultra running, can we talk about Jaybird? For my listeners who don't know what Jaybird is, would you please tell us? Yeah, so Jaybird is uh, a Bluetooth uh, sport headphone company. So um, really focused on uh, consumers that are putting uh, headphones to the test through sport, through fitness, um, and have a really different use case and different need from companies that are producing technology for the year. And so. We're producing a, a set of headphones that are really crafted or built for um, athletes that are pushing, you know, boundaries and pushing uh, the technology at a different level than maybe different use cases. I should always say that the reason I wanted to interview is because I am a big fan of Jaber headphones. <laughs> I use I'm glad them, to hear that. Yeah, I use them when I'm on the trail with either running or on the mountain bike. Sure. And I actually came across them by tweeting Rich Roll, who's an ultra-powered... No, Plant Powered Ultra Athlete, yep. who is your ambassador, and I'm a huge fan of him. And I said to him, like, what headphones do you use? Because mine had finally given up the ghost, and I wanted wireless <laughs> ones, and he recommended Jaybird. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, I mean, um, Rich and, uh, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have fans, you know, that, that really are passionate about um, our product. Um, but we're working with, with uh, athletes kind of across the board. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, a lot of them ultra athletes that you know, are, are great for us in terms of the relationship in, in testing our products. Mm -hmm. And ultra runners, uh, as an example, are, are perfect sort of ambassadors for our brand in a lot of ways, because if we can craft or create products uh, that work in those conditions, then, you know, they work kind of for the rest of us. And for those of us who aren't running 50 miles or 100 miles no. in a day, um, if we can kind of um, build products that live up to those expectations, then, then, you know, they work great in the gym and they work great, you know, for the 5K street run too. Yeah. And I also like the idea that I'm using headphones that Rory Bozio uses. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> you feel a bit she, cooler when I'm she, running. <laughs> 
she is not only an incredible athlete and as you probably know a two-time UTMB winner but yeah. is also just an incredible human being and just a pleasure to work with so she's she's a great person to get feedback from and um, kind of just kind of push the, our products so where was she? So you have so you've recently launched the wild, the Run Wild campaign, which we're going to dive into. But in the first video, I think, or in the video you do about her, she's running through this most amazing landscape. I actually had to pause the video. Yeah. And there are mountains in the background, and she's running across like a maybe like a really shallow kind of like, sounds so ridiculous. Yeah. Like it's like a massive puddle. Yeah. And it's a very <laughs> shallow like expanse of water where is that that is actually just outside of salt lake city utah no and way that's where flats. you live yeah so um, i thought it looked a bit salt flat but i was like that won't be fi- that won't be filmed in chile yeah no it's um you know the we are super fortunate so jaybird is headquartered in park city utah yeah um which many will will recognize the name from hosting olympics but you know known in in the u.s for for just being this incredible mountain town i think mm-hmm. um one of the top five towns in the U.S. for miles per, per capita and, and miles in a small town. So I think we have over 500 miles of trails. Um, and and there's a reason. That? Yeah, <laughs> there, there's there's a reason why we're there, which is um, with um, the U.S. Winter Olympics team based there, and with um, just a community of people that are passionate about the outdoors mm-hmm. and passionate about um, you know adventure mindsets and and just testing limits and 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 being outdoors we can tap into an incredible community just outside our back door to to test our products and and so obviously a a a strong logic to how we've ended up there as a company but um yeah rory uh and the run wild campaign she um you know we filmed that while she was at the athlete camp in park city working with andy walsh and um captured that footage because it happens to be pretty close to our, our, our backyard, so. Yeah, as I said, I literally, she was running across it and I just paused the video and I was like, oh my goodness, like, yeah. where is that? Yeah, it's, I was like, I wanna go running there. <laughs> it's special and, and you know, Utah is an interesting place, probably a state that not, not everyone outside of the US really has a lot of familiarity with, but um, from Park City, which is mountain, you know, sort of trees, mm. um, you know, very sort of wildernessy, um, just, you know, uh, a couple hundred miles away in South Utah, you have the desert. So you have basically all types of oh, climates wow. in one state, which is pretty oh, spectacular. I'm so jealous. Yeah. And what, so you've been, you're quite new to Jaybird. You've been CEO for seven to eight months. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Yep. I'm getting good at this. <laughs> <laughs> and what really attracted you to work for Jaybird? Yeah. So, you know, by way of context, um, you know, I'd spent the vast majority of my career in the sports space and sport industry working for Nike. And um, as I mentioned, you know, I have always tried to find um, ways to, to marry my passion, mm-hmm. my, my passion for the outdoors, my, my passions outside of work with work. And so as an athlete growing up, um, have sort of loved working in the space where I'm working with athletes and supporting athletes. Um, and spent 15 years at Nike. And, and when I got the opportunity and the call to, to join Jaybird, um, for me, it was an amazing sort of project and, and sort of next step um, because Jaybird's mission is kind of taking technology, in this case, Bluetooth headphones, and, and working on products that help consumers either get out the door and, and go for their first run, or in Rory's case, um, you know, get faster for a 100 mile race. Mm. and. Um, sort of that that intersection of technology and sport is such an exciting space to be. So to, to be able to work for a global brand that's trying to solve those problems and, and really build great products that help um, everyday consumers become more fit or, or um, get into the mindset of, of sport um, mm-hmm. was a pretty exciting challenge. I also love your new tagline, designed for athletes, made for adventure. Yeah, built for adventure. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And, and, you know, I think... You know, we, we're sort of an interesting cross-section because we come from this small mountain town. Um, you know, we create products for um, versatile usage, meaning versatile sports, runners, cyclists, etc. cetera. Um, but the, that Park City feel um, is more about that mountain adventure mm. um, lifestyle. And so we try to marry those two things because that's kind of how we live our lives. You know, it's... Um, we were talking a little bit about the, yeah. the commute to work and, 
um, we're so fortunate because I run over a, a mountain to get to my office. And Michael, that's the best commute ever. <laughs> it really is. And, and so, you know, I think for us, it's not um, just about the traditional sport. It's about exuding that, that sense of adventure to, you know, the everyday practice of sport that feels a little bit more fun and makes it a little bit more exciting to get out there. And so that's what we try to capture. You do that very well. <laughs> <laughs> we try, we try. What have you found to be your biggest challenge so far at Jaybird? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, I came from Nike and, and came from sort of the traditional world of sport, which is more footwear apparel. And, you know, for me, you know, what made this super exciting, but also probably the most challenging for me was just the learning curve of, mm -hmm. of shifting from the technology of footwear and apparel to true technology and working with nanotechnology and, and really creating something in a package the size of an ear. And um, the, because your new, if your new earbuds even, they're like the size of your thumbnail, aren't they? They are, yeah. yeah. And they're getting smaller and smaller. And um, you know, the engineering feats to make something high quality in that size package. Um, is an incredible challenge, you know, and, you know, to also add the, the layer of complexity of the things that we want to do to build it for an athlete, which is waterproofing and sealing and some of those things, the comfort that you need um, to make it enjoyable for a run. Um, it's, each product is definitely a, a major feat in engineering and, and it's what makes it so exciting too, you know, to be able to solve those problems and make products better and better to serve athletes that are testing it at different limits um, is um, is both a challenge and what makes it so fun. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And what's been one of the things you've done to help you on this learning curve? You know, the learning you find as, as a leader of, of any team or organization is you surround yourself with the best possible people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we have an incredible team um, located around the world. I think uh, my global team is actually in 14 different time zones. Um, different time zones? Yeah. We, oh my god. We do that though to just make sure we can find the best of the best yeah. and um, bring a world-class team together to solve those problems. And, you know, beyond just the engineering side of things, obviously there is a lot more that goes into crafting great product. and. Um, we were talking, one of the, one of the uh, members of the team that joined around the same time I did was Dr. Andy Walsh. And, you know, he brings a philosophy of performance and a philosophy of how to work with elite athletes mm. that also helps us make our products get better and better. And would you just tell our listeners who Dr. Andy Walsh is? Yeah, so, so Andy is, um, and he'd, he'd probably be um, scared that I'm talking about him. <laughs> um, so such a humble human being, but is I would probably say probably in the top three to five sports scientists mm. in the in on the planet. Um, and his passion is working with elite athletes that have kind of moonshot goals. Um, so he finds sort of the the that intersection of things that can't be done and solving it through both the science of, of sport but also technology as that sort of interesting cross-section. His background, um, he spent 10 years at the Red Bull High Performance yeah. Center, um, you know, working on projects like the, the stratosphere jump, but prior to that had um, led the sports science side um, for the U.S. Winter Olympic ski team, and then before that the Australian Olympic team. So, you know, has a long sort of uh, career in working with elite athletes mm. and helping them improve in every aspect of how they approach their sports. What an amazing person to have on your team. Yeah, super fortunate. I mean, that that's just one of many uh, on the Jaybird team that yeah. I, I would say I'm super fortunate to just get to come to work with every but day. But your lunch conversations must be so good. <laughs> <laughs> While sitting there looking at the mountains in Park yeah. City. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not lost on me how, how lucky I am. Yeah, I'm not sure. envious at all. <laughs> <laughs> and... Could we now kind of segue into your passion for ultra running? How did you get into that? Yeah, it, it's it's really funny because I would say um, I started off with almost a um, loathing of running in a lot of ways. <laughs> I um, I as I mentioned, I I sort of came uh, through youth as more of a team sport mm -hmm. um, athlete. And running for me was really looked at as, as sort of a, a part of the program of training for my sport, but I, I grew up passionate about chasing balls around and being a part of a team. Um, 
I was really fortunate to, to marry my wife, um, who was an elite runner, and, and naturally um, uh, our community around us in, in Portland was, was a running community. And so I sort of got into it through her and through just being around a community that was passionate about running. Um, but ironically, my, my true passion for running actually came out while I was living here in the UK in Manchester and started fell running. I didn't realize you lived in Manchester. I did, yeah. So oh when I started fell running um, and, and kind of almost immediately signed up for my first ultra, mm-hmm. um, more as a challenge to myself and something that I didn't think I could do, um, I realized that there was a major mindset shift that I went through that made it so much more enjoyable for me. And, and I came from a community that was all about PBs and PRs and how fast did you run a 5K? And if it was under, you know, if it was over 17 minutes, it was not a good race for most of the people that I was surrounded by. And, you know, that just wasn't me. And that's great for certain folks, but I wasn't about kind of clocking my time. And um, when I got into fell running, it became more about, I just got to stay on my feet. I just got to keep moving forward. And as you start doing training running for, for ultras, going from you know, a four hour run to a six hour run to an eight hour run, um, it became more about how do I just challenge myself by dropping myself somewhere and figuring out how I get back. Mm-hmm. And it really became an adventure. And so we were talking about the yeah. adventure mindset and that's where it really clicked for me, that I was super passionate more about the sense of exploration, the sense of challenging my, myself on um, you know, staying on my feet longer than I'd ever before. And I sort of lost that, you know, um, pressure of did I, what was the pace of that mile? And I let those things go. It was super okay to stop and take a picture and not worry about, well, I just lost 30 seconds, you know? And so unlocking that, that mindset made it so much more fun for me. And, and so that was sort of my first ultra was, just challenging myself to do something that I didn't think I could do. Mm-hmm. And it, it got me to a place where I just fell in love with, with the sport. And how does it feel when you're running on the trail? You know, it, it, it's funny. I, what I enjoy about it is, um, particularly when I'm on trails mm. um, and in sort of the more outdoor settings, um, for me, it's just a place to disconnect, you mm-hmm. know? And, and it kind of connects with what we were just talking about, which is, um, I'm not somebody who's wearing, you know, the watch and checking the pace all the time. Um, for me, it's much more about disconnecting, about sort of the freedom of just getting outside and the fresh air. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it's very liberating. And what do you feel has been, is there like a standout moment when you've been on a trail and something that you've experienced something that's been mind blowing? Yeah, I'm probably going to go, I'm going to zig when you're expecting me to zag, but, um, yeah, go for it. um it, I would say one of the, the first times that I had an experience like that was um, was the first ultra that I did. It was called mm-hmm. the Mountain Man in Switzerland, and uh, seven thousand vertical meters of climbing in a day. And how and many miles is it over? It was fifty miles. 50 miles. And um, it wasn't a, a vista or a scenery mm-hmm. that was so mind blowing. What was mind blowing to me, and I think a lot of people have had this experience, was the true appreciation of what the ultra community was, mm. and. I think for every person who's tried or attempted an ultra, you hit a wall, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time when you hit the mental wall that tells you that physically you're done. Yeah. And we all know that, you know, your your physical capabilities go well beyond what we think we can do. Um, But almost to a T, everyone who's experienced that first ultra or that second ultra um, has that moment where somebody that they don't know picks them up. And I had that experience, a professional um, ultra racer having a bad day. You know, we had hit a couple aid stations together and um, at probably the 41, 42 mile mark, I I pretty much hit that wall. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't know each other, but we began chatting just because we were kind of running at the same pace for the time. And um, she goes, you know what, sit down for a second. And we sat down. She's like, have a drink of water, just catch your breath. Take, take a minute, you know, we'll get there, don't worry. And she paused, stopped, you know, on a race day for her and just made sure that, you know, I mentally got through that pain point. And then after a minute, she was like, okay, get up and we're just gonna walk. And we walked for probably a quarter mile or a half mile. And she's like, do you think you can jog a little bit? And, you know, that moment, um, a person that I didn't know at all 
basically got me to the finish line, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't have, have gone there by myself. And that's sort of what the ultra community is known for, is that sense of community, that, yeah. that sense of we love people joining this crazy adventure. And um, pretty much everyone I know that's, that's tried it has had an experience in some way like that. And that's what I that's what I absolutely love about it is that sense of community. And that's that was sort of that wow moment that I had. And it yeah. wasn't a view or it wasn't getting to travel to some place. It was really about um, the sense of connection and community in a sport that's normally known for individualism. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that that's what got me hooked. That's incredible. What an amazing experience. Yeah, totally. And w- when you had that pause, what went, what was going through your mind? <laughs> Not much, um, <laughs> other than I'm I'm in pain that I've never yeah. experienced before. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, I think you know everyone hits that point at some moment or another where you go, I I don't know if physically I can break through this, mm. and um, it, it really isn't a physical exercise. It's much more of a of a mental one, um, but. Um, you, you kind of hit a barrier for the first time that you go, I don't know if I can push through this. Or you're saying, I actually don't, I'm not going to push through this. Mm. And, um, you know, what you find and what's so liberating about kind of endurance sports in general is that freedom or, or just that excitement of knowing that you can push your boundaries, right? And um, that you can go farther than you thought you, you could. And so I think at that moment I was thinking, I'm, I don't know if I can get through this and and potentially, ultimately, am, am I a failure because I, I set this goal and I'm not going to get there? Um, but in, in, in so many cases, I think people have the experience that I do, which is, you know, you, you figure out a way to, to get yeah. through it. This is the perfect time to, to ask you the question I've been dying to know Uh-oh. the answer to you <laughs> or to explore with you even, is how has that ultra running mindset and the lessons you've learned helped you in your journey to becoming or well, to being the CEO of Jaybird? Yeah. You know, I, I think they're parallel paths, but, um, you know, a lot of what we talked about in, in my experiences in ultras are just about um, a couple of simple things that mm-hmm. I think help us be effective in, in every aspect of our lives, careers um, and other parts. But um, it's, it's the sense of, you're going to hit challenges and and how do you calmly work through them how do you navigate through um hitting a wall hitting a barrier um you know hitting self-doubts about yourself and remaining calm and and working through them and pushing through those boundaries but but secondarily um that sense of community that in challenging situations whether they're athletic pursuits like ultras or 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 career pursuits, that it's not an individual exercise, that it is a team uh, event, that it is a community event, and that, um, you know, relying on people or or connecting with people to solve problems together is always better than uh, doing it individually. And I think that maybe resonates with me the most, which is, you know, I wouldn't have gotten through it without somebody else there on, yep. on the race day in Switzerland. Um, the same is true for business and, and throughout my career that I certainly wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had without incredible people around me. And, um, you know, that's actually one of the, the filters when I'm, when I'm navigating my career and thinking about opportunities is who am I working with and, um, you know, how, how can I just work with the best possible people and the best possible teams because, that's ultimately what makes you the best, but also, you know, um, allows you to become even better. And how do you find those kind of people? How do you gather them around you? That's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I think you, you tend to find people that have similar passions and similar pursuits. Um, and you just naturally gravitate to them Mm -hmm. because you share those things. And, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have, um, you know, some pretty cool experiences um, where I've just gotten to meet world-class people. Um, you know, going to business school, I have lived in Manchester, as I mentioned, but also in Sao Paulo, Brazil for um, four years. And for four years? Yeah. How did you end up there? So uh, working at Nike, I had just finished my job at Manchester United and they had asked me to move down to Brazil 
in advance of the World Cup and the Olympics to work in the Brazil market and work through those two events um, running our so sportswear division. When you say division. enhance the Olympics, do you mean the Rio Olympics? Yes, yeah. Oh, that was, so, that was recently then? Yeah, so I, I lived there through uh, 2016. With your family? With my family. In fact, my daughter was born there. She's a Brazilian citizen. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, part of, of my fortune of, of just you know, often finding myself surrounded by yeah. just people that inspire me and, and are incredible people are, has been that willingness to, to take adventure, you know, even into my career space, which is jump on opportunities that maybe other people would, would find a little scary. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you find other people that are following those same paths and, and have taken similar risks. And yes. it happens in all different places. I think the more important thing is recognizing that there are incredible people out there everywhere yes. and in every um, person's community and and just making sure that they recognize the value of, of a quality around them and, and what they can learn from the people around them. So I just want to go back a little bit. So you sure. were <laughs> yeah. I threw you off there during the Olympics. I was there for the World Cup and the Olympics. And so this is very naive, the Football World Cup. The Football World Cup. Sorry, I'm not, yes. <laughs> yeah. yep. I'm not a huge follower of football. <laughs> um, what was that like, being there during that time and working? Were you involved directly with it, with Nike? Yeah, so I ran um, what Nike calls Nike Sportswear, um, uh -huh. which is the lifestyle side of, oh. of the Nike business. So. Yeah most mostly known for their shoes right like yeah. the iconic air force one and air max 90 and air max one um so that was my business but um the lifestyle side is very much a big part of those events because um a lot of the products that we create for athletes are more on the lifestyle side mm. so if you think about metal stand jackets right metal stand jackets like the track jackets that when people you... wear on the on the stand when they receive their medals is made from the Nike sportswear division. So oh, I did not even know that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so th there's a there's a couple of very iconic products that we work on for those types of events that that That's came so out of my group, cool. which was yeah a lot of fun. Wow. Um, and what was it like being there? Obviously, yeah. in in some ways, uh, incredible because. Um, I'd been in the UK when the London Olympics happened, working um, with United. But um, you know, to to be in any country hosting an event like that on the world stage is is super special. Even if you're not an athlete, you know, those moments are things that we all stop to watch, right? Yeah. And um, to get to to work on those and and bring those events to life. Um, you know, are is exactly what I talked about: marrying passion with with my job, and so. Um, it was super fun. I think, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, where, where I feel like as an American living in the UK is, is a relatively easy step. There are still mm -hmm. cultural differences and, and, you know, different things that you learn from living in a different country. You know, sharing the same language and some of those things makes it easier when you move to um, a place like Brazil. Um, it's much more challenging, mm -hmm. you know, for me, for my family, in terms of just a much bigger step of, of uh, new culture, of new experiences. And so that's what's so rewarding about it, but it's also, it can be exhausting at times. I'd love to stay in this area with you sure, for a sure. but I want to pedal back to the first thing you mentioned with the mindset and talking about how you need to push through the challenges and the mental barriers in a very calm fashion. How do you do that? Like, what's your top practice for staying calm and pushing through those mental barriers? Yeah, you know, I, I think I would have maybe if you talked to me two years ago, just mm -hmm. said, you know, develop a plan, stay organized, you know, uh, break it down into bite-sized chunks and solve smaller problems um, to get to the uh, to the goal. But I, but I actually, I think in the last two years have have also tapped into a, a second mechanism, mm -hmm. which is, and, and we talked about this a little bit with our first chapter of Run Wild, which um, is about mindfulness and breathing. Mm -hmm. And there's an aspect of organization and breaking you know, complex problems into their simpler parts and solving those that is absolutely true and necessary to, to break through barriers and to, or to solve something that's, that's um, challenging. 
but I'm developing a stronger and stronger appreciation for also just the awareness of self and, and sort of becoming more mindful. Mm -hmm. um, because when you can tap into um, the ability to breathe, the ability to, um, you know, just let yourself um, relax a little bit, um, those skill sets are just as important in, um, you know, maintaining sort of the right approach or the right philosophy to solve complex challenges. And so, you know, Run Wild in our first chapter, the Park City chapter, was all about that. Mm. Elite athletes um, are solving challenging problems and challenges all the time. And they have access to science and nutrition and all of those things that a lot of us don't have. What we found, though, is that oftentimes the thing that they don't have a whole lot of exposure to is the way to just manage stress, which is simple tools like breathing. And that's what Andy Walsh takes them through on that chapter. And what do you, so with your breath, do you meditate or how do you practice that? Yeah, it, it, you know, it, in that chapter, it, it's, it's actually a great example of, of different ways um, to approach it. It is all about the breath, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, what we did in that that episode was actually put the athletes in some pretty incredible situations. Yeah, because one of them was like a frozen lake that you <laughs> yes. dipped them into. <laughs> yes, in the middle of winter in yeah. Park City, Utah. Um, and we, so we did a, a couple of different things with them, but it was all about how do you focus back on the breath and focus back on getting your body into a calmer state. And one... Uh, episode was plunging them into a frozen lake. Um, you know, another was actually they came across a bear that we had hired, um, a grizzly bear. Oh my and God, you actually filmed the bear? Yeah. This is it. I assumed you like paid for the footage. It sounds really No, cool. no, that bear is Bart the oh Bear. God, he actually real. lives in, in Utah. And uh, I love that bit with the bear coming out. And I was like, that was so great. <laughs> he is a famous um, movie bear and, and oh, well-trained. but Celebrity it's bear. Still, it's still a grizzly bear. <laughs> and we do those things. Um, they're, they're obviously fun and they're, you know, weeks and days and months later they're the talked about parts of yeah, an athlete cool. camp um but we do them because um that jolt or that moment of um fear mm. is something that puts them in a state that then they can focus on things like breathing and yep. and those skill sets then you know can be applied to moments like i was talking about in my first ultra where you can mentally get through barriers in an endurance you know sport or in an endurance challenge that our athletes are taking on um so it, you know it, it it is one of those things that i'm i'm not super knowledgeable about but i'm finding myself um trying to learn more and more because i think um the aspect of mindfulness the aspect of breathing is an area that for athletes is going to become more and more important um as we train and as we try to get yeah. better well i think so <laughs> i might be biased <laughs> For sure. And so we've touched upon your new Run Wild campaign quite a lot now. Could you please tell us what it is? Yeah, so so Run Wild actually, in a lot of ways, kicked off with, with that athlete camp um, and was inspired um, by some of our athletes. Effectively, Run Wild is a journey of two of our athletes, um, Rory, who, who we've mentioned, and also Knox uh, Robinson, uh, we haven't. Could you tell us, because I think everyone knows who Rory Boisio is. Yeah. Because she's big in the in the UK and in Europe. Yep. Um, who is Knox? So so Knox is um, somebody that I've kind of circled actually a couple of times because he was uh, one of the founding um, supporters of Nike Run Club and was a Nike athlete. Oh no way. Um, but he has an incredible back background. He not only is an elite runner. Um, but he also was formerly the editor of Fader Magazine, which is a popular magazine in New York um, that covers the music scene. Mm -hmm. um, he is the founder of the Black Roses, which is a run crew in New York, similar to Rundum Crew, which is um, coming up actually this week, is, is the featured chapter for Run Wild. I saw it. It's so good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, but Knox and Rory, obviously two elite um, athletes in the running space, but also come from totally different worlds. One mm -hmm. much more city oriented, one much more mountain trail oriented. Which one is which? Sorry. Knox City, Rory Mountain Trail, mm -hmm. and um, but they have this this 
unbelievably shared passion for traveling the world running mm -hmm. and the passion for who they meet along the way, the culture, you know, the, the sights and sounds of running culture is what really moves them. And so, you know, we, we sort of gravitated to this idea of they both love you know, seeing the running world, the running community and running culture around, around the world, why don't we follow them on a journey? And, great. you know, how it's really evolved is they are both taking trips to different places, special places around the world mm -hmm. um, and meeting some pretty incredible influencers along the way. But it's really becoming chapter by chapter a narrative of where running is going Yeah. Um, through the lens of the people that they meet. And, uh, you know, what we try to do and, and what I think makes makes running fun for all of us is not only capture just sort of the, you know, the focus on the actual sport, but also the culture around it, the music mm -hmm. that powers people uh, to run in different places around the world um, and what motivates them to, to get out there and run. And so, um, you know, the combination of those things is sort of what embodies Jaybird, but also embodies a great story and what gets us all motivated to, to do it every day. I really liked this chapter two of the Run Wild campaign. It's based in London. <laughs> it is. And it's all to do with rhythm. And I've actually not come across the Run Dem crew, but I'm not going to look them up because I was like, they look like a really fun group to run with. But I loved how you combined his story with his own music that he's written to create a running video. And it really comes across with your brand marrying up the performance with just enjoying running for the sake of running. Yeah, Charlie Dark, who you're referring to, who's yeah. uh, the founder of Rundum Crew, is uh, a pretty special human being. As as you can see from from the chapter, um, that music um, that's highlighted the spoken word is all done by him. Yeah, um, and it's a really good tune. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's a soundtrack that you'd want to go out and run yeah, to, right? Totally. And it's, it's just incredible. Actually, and sorry, my favorite part was when he, I don't know um, whose idea it was, but it was when you used the sounds, I'm going to send this to my podcast producer because he'll love this, but you used the sounds of the city like spraying cans and graffiti, yeah. the tube running, people walking, people talking, footsteps, and that was weaved into the beat of the tune. Yep. I was like, that was mind blowing. That was yeah. so good. And, and, he, and he talks about it so eloquently in his, um, in his narrative that we captured, which is, you know, he's inspired by the rhythm of his city, mm. right? And he, and he actually talks about, you know, oftentimes he's running at 3 a.m. or 5 a.m., right? He either runs really late at the end of his day or really early. And there's all these special things that make London, London, mm. and sounds that make those moments so special. And, and he's just incredible in terms of capturing those things and weaving them into, into music. And so, you know, Charlie is a great example of, of the types of people that Knox and Rory are meeting and their viewpoints on running and where running is going, at least for me, is, is so interesting and so fun to follow. And so, you know, the, this idea of this film series being kind of in chapter form, um, for us was a really fun one because yeah. it's like, we continue to want to see more from different aspects of different parts of the world, different people from around the world, and how they approach running. And there's so many different approaches. They're all unique and different, but they're all super inspiring. Mm. I can't wait for chapter three. Unfortunately, we need to start wrapping up. <laughs> so in everything that we've spoken about, in one or two sentences, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, well, first of all, thank you so much for just letting me chat with you for, for a bit. The things that I've found helpful along the way are kind of marrying passion with pursuit and, mm -hmm. and marrying career with the things that I'm passionate about outside of work. I think we all find that if you're passionate about something, you pursue it a little bit harder. And so I've always found that to be a successful trait. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the things that we're doing at Jaybird are, um, you know, just trying to help the everyday consumer take that next step. And if it's from the couch to your first 5K, fantastic. And if it's you're closer to Rory and you're, you know, got uh, an eye on UTMB at some point and are looking to finish a 100 mile race, you know, that we're there as a brand for, for you too. And so, um, you know, hopefully that's helpful for folks. And I actually have a surprise oh, no. <laughs> for the podcast. <laughs> um, I always do a wildfire round, which I did I just happened to left out. <laughs> are you ready? Oh, no, yeah. We've just I guess got, so. we've got two minutes. So it's going to be. Good fire round. What book have you gifted the most? Ironically, it, it's 
it's one of two because there's there's a few we were we were talking about yeah. uh, rituals finding ultra um which is is an a crazy story and he is he he's done some pretty amazing things on his journey in his life um so i find that super inspirational and it was one of the books that i i found uh really helpful as i was going on my journey but there's also a book called the clean diet and i can't even remember the author's the clean. name the clean diet um i am not capable of following it but um it, it it's a lot it's written a lot like born to run where it weaves story with with the science um in terms of just sort of um I think it's onto something in terms of what a natural diet should be, and, yeah. and as I said, I I can't follow it to a T. Um, but even by reading it, I've just picked up a few things that have, have helped me sort of just navigate sort of nutrition um, that's been beneficial. So yeah. I've passed that on to a few family and friends too. I'm going to squeeze in one question because I really want to ask this one. If you could take one person, past or present, on a run with you, who would you take and where would you go? Oh, you know, this this one's probably going to connect back to Brazil for me um, and my football roots or soccer roots. I would love to run with Pele. Um, you know, he, he was an icon um, and an incredible athlete in a sport that I am incredibly passionate about. Um, and because I have this deep connection, emotional connection to Brazil, I think he's just, he's an incredible figure. I don't know him obviously at all, but um, just from what he's done on the pitch or on the field, um, I'd love to, to, to tap into his brain and see what he's all about. And I'd love to do a run sort of in Brazil, potentially not, he's from Sao Paulo, um, but in Rio, which is one of my favorite places to run just because of the epic kind of nature yeah. meets city landscape. Um, so that's that's probably where I'd where I'd start. Awesome! Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and taking this massive whim and time out of your day. <laughs> I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful to talk with you. Absolutely, thank you. Me too. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Just one more thing before you take off. If you would like to achieve extraordinary performance, then do sign up to my weekly email at adelaidegadeef.com forward slash subscribe. Each week, I send out just a short email containing one mindset practice that will help you perform at your best. You'll also receive my free ebook with superhuman Olaf Dulner on developing a tough mindset, something you do not want to miss. You can just go to adelaidegadeev.com forward slash subscribe and sign up there for free. I am also on Instagram at adelaidegadeev and would love to connect with you on there too. So thank you so much for tuning in and I hope to see you next time.